Well, good evening and welcome to our Thought for Thursdays. Um, I want to introduce to you attorney Lakeisha Ledbetter Anderson. She is a wife and a mother of three. And um, she did her um, graduate studies at Dillard University, graduating with honors. And she attended, um, got her Juris Doctorate from Thurgood Marshall Law School and obtained her law degree and then became um, a licensed attorney. She practices all types of law, her and her husband. They own their own Ledbetter Anderson Associates, LLC. And with further ado, let me introduce you to Attorney Anderson. Thank you, Ms. Braff, for, for that wonderful mm -hmm. introduction. <laughs> As um, Sister Bradford said, my name is Lakeisha Ledbetter Anderson. I am the, one of the founding members of Ledbetter Anderson and Associates, a law firm that is based primarily in Houston, in the Houston, Texas area. We do practice in um, Missouri. And so this presentation today, well, before I go on, um, I have been licensed for 13 years now, and I have practiced in the area of estate planning, uh, family law, and criminal pretty much all of that 13 years. So today we are going to be discussing estate planning and elder care. These are going to, it's going to be a general overview, some tips and just some little nuggets of wisdom on what you should do, what you should be looking out for, um, really at any stage of life. But we'll focus kind of the end of the presentation more on those things we should be thinking, at, thinking about as we age and as we reach retirement age, okay? So what we're going to be going over today is going to be what is an estate plan and what does it do? How often should I review my estate plan once I have one? Or if I already have one, how often should I be looking at it? And what is elder law? Many people don't know uh, what elder law actually is. And just some things, I'm going to give you some tips and some little nuggets of information as to what things you should be considering, what things you should be thinking about as we age, gracefully, hopefully. So an estate plan is basically like a roadmap for your loved ones once you pass on or you have a major life event or in, or, um, in the event of an immediate emergency. So you want to have some sort of an estate plan in place for things like, oh, I just got into a really bad car accident. I'm unconscious. Um, somebody has to make medical decisions for me or I have little ones at home who's going to take custody or care for them um, or I may not. You know, I may have had a really bad accident, whether it's a vehicle accident or some other type of accident, and I'm no longer able to care for myself. So who is going to step in and help me take care of those things, whether I've lost some sort of memory or I've had some sort of traumatic brain injury or, or something of the like? Um, we typically run into these issues, and a lot of the times people don't think about these things until it's already happened. And by the time it's already happened, it's too late to do a number of the things that I'm going to talk about uh, today. So what is the purpose of your estate plan? Your estate plan allows you to leave a legacy. It allows you to transfer your assets. It allows you to transfer your wealth and allows you to preserve your value as it pertains to those, that legacy that you're leaving on. Um, to those to those individuals you choose to leave your your assets or your wealth or your property or per, whether that's personal or real property. But the purpose is to provide support and financial stability for your family, preserve your assets for future generations if that is your your desire, and um, have the intended distribution of your assets. So what that means specifically is I intend to provide for these individuals rather than the law dictating how my property passes. Um, so you can leave your assets in the way in which you want to leave your assets. The, an estate plan will also allow you to minimize your expenses and taxes if possible. And you can communicate medical wishes, um, who you want to provide for you or take care of you, 
and to take care of you as a person or take care of your finances in the event you're not able to do so. And also just to preserve your values and preserve your values as it pertains to your medical care, uh, medical decisions that you want to make now before those um, those situations come upon you. And, so, and sometimes just to remove the stress or the burden of having a spouse or some other family member, a child or whatnot, make certain medical decisions. An estate plan can also minimize conflict in the event that you are no longer able to make decisions for yourself because you will have already laid out these decisions in your estate plan and all everybody has to do is just follow the roadmap that you've already created. So here we're going to talk about some of the planning tools that we can use in our estate plan. Will is going to be the first one that we're going to discuss. A will is a legal document that names who will receive your property when you pass away. It also names someone to manage your estate, which is generally called the executor or executrix. It just depends on your preference. Executrix is usually used for a female that is appointed. Executor is usually the term that is used for a male when that person is appointed. Um, but executor can be used for both female and male, just again, it's your preference and style. And it also names someone to care for your minor children or your disabled children, which is generally called a guardian. Now, when we get to guardians, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about it, but you can have a guardian of the person, which is the person that is going to care for you as an individual. Um, and then there's also a guardian of the estate, and that person handles your financial matters. Guardianships are very restrictive on the person which we would call the ward who the guardianship would be over that person is called the ward so guardianships are very restrictive over those individuals the courts do not take guardianships lightly because essentially when we are asking for a guardianship over someone we are removing all of their rights or a good portion of their rights and the, a will most people understand oh i need a will but a lot of people don't understand how the will is used or in what other ways and what other tools can be used in conjunction with your will to make up your estate plan and help provide that roadmap for your family. Maybe that is either, that's either left behind or that has to make some sort of decision in a period of incapacity um, or serious injury or illness. Other tools you can use are called, or a trust is another um, tool you can use, and it's an arrangement whereby property is legally owned or managed by a person or entity for the benefit of another. So the simplest way I can explain a trust is think of it much like you would a corporation or um, some other business entity you would form. A trust is going to be a completely separate entity, separate and apart from the individual or the beneficiaries or the, the people for which the trust will benefit. Um, and so Usually the trust will own whether that's proper, real property or personal property or um, stocks, bonds, or whatnot. Now a trustee would be appointed to manage the trust. And in some instances, you can be your own trustee over your trust. And in some instances, depending on the state that you live in, it may not be beneficial for you to be your own trustee. But in some states, it, it, it can be. A trust can also protect your assets from um, divorce, uh, lawsuits, or any number of other things because you won't own that property personally, but you'll still have the benefit and use of the property and any income that would stem from that property, you could still use it much like you would outside of the trust, okay? And your trust agreement will dictate how the property within the trust should be managed and handled. And if you pass away or uh, one of the other beneficiaries pass away or your trust property reaches a certain level, that trust agreement will um, determine how uh, the assets in the trust are, are passed on to other individuals or other, other beneficiaries. Powers of attorney legal as a legal document that authorizes someone to act on your behalf. Generally, there are two types of powers of attorney. There's a financial power of attorney, which most people are familiar with, the durable powers of attorney or general powers of attorney, and then there's a medical power of attorney. The medical power of attorney allows someone to make medical decisions on your behalf. Now, you can make those as broad or as restricted as you'd like, 
Um, but you need to be thinking about when you are appointing someone, this needs to be someone you ultimately trust, you know will make the right decision, won't be influenced by others, or, or you've had a conversation with these individuals so they kind of know what your wishes are and they can continue to make those decisions in according to what your wishes actually are. Um, making someone power of attorney is a very is a very trusted position. So if you make someone a power of attorney, they essentially step into your shoes and they're able to do anything that you would be able to do yourself. So um, close close bank accounts, make withdrawals, um, transfer, change the beneficiary, change or add um, payable on death on certain accounts. And like I said, with some of these powers of attorney, you can make them a little bit more restrictive where your power of attorney won't be able to do all of that. Um, and then sometimes you can make them very broad where they can do everything from sell your property, um, to mortgage your property, take out debt in your name, all sorts of things. So you want to make sure that the person you decide to be your power of attorney is somebody you really trust. HIPAA, um, which is generally people know the acronym HIPAA, which is deals with your medical records and the privacy of your medical records um, as it relates to your medical provider. Uh, so having a HIPAA document in your estate plan, you can appoint somebody to gain access to your medical records, your health information, and medical history. These are very important, especially if you're going to have a medical power of attorney, because that person who you appoint as your power of attorney for medical reasons will need to have some of this information so that they can make informed decisions as it pertains to your medical care in the event you are unable to do so, okay? Declarations of guardian. Uh, we talked about guardianship a little bit um, a while ago, but just to um, reiterate, this, um, I have a typo here, sorry guys. So declarations of guardian allow you, while you are mentally able to do so, to appoint someone as your guardian, um, should the need arise. And like I explained before, guardianships are very restricted. Guardianship, generally the person over which the guardianship um, is for, like I said, is called the ward. So generally when you do a guardianship, that person loses their right to drive, their right to vote, um, their right to um, enter into contract. Their, I mean, the list can go on and on and on and on as regards to the rights that they lose. They're, they basically revert to being like a child and you are kind of in that parent position and responsible for their 24-hour care, just like you would your minor children. Um, and I'm not talking about like your adult children that you still care for in the home and those sorts of things. So when we talk about guardianship and having an actual guardianship over someone, you are essentially stepping into the shoes of a parent essentially over this person and they are not able to make any kind of decisions. Now there are some limited guardianships and um, those will restrict just certain rights. So you may be able to remove, okay, they can't um, do, they can't make financial decisions. They can still vote, they cannot drive, um, but they may not be able to um, open and close bank accounts or enter contracts or anything of that sort. And so usually before we get to a guardianship, courts want to evaluate whether or not there's a less restrictive means to managing this person's affairs before they go in. That's how serious guardianships are. So when you're thinking me. about, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Can can yes. can we stop and ask questions? Sure. Jump in. Okay. The question is being asked on the floor. When a person is appointed for power of attorney, can that person be changed or replaced? How easy is it to do? The cha making changes in your estate plan are pretty simple, especially if you use the same person that you created your estate plan with. And I'll get to that in just a second, but I'm, I'm going to answer your question. Um, it is pretty simple. 
but you need to, you'll have to revoke any prior document when you uh, make the new one. And so you want to make sure the new one complies with everything. Like if you just wanted to change a person, um, that's pretty simple. But if there's some powers and different things you want to change or some limitations you want to put in, um, that requires a complete new drafting. And so you want to make sure that whatever the change is, it still is honoring your initial um, appointment, but maybe whatever, but incorporates whatever changes you, you desire at that time. But we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So just hold on for me just a little bit, okay? Okay. And then, so advanced directives. Advanced directives are usually what people refer to as a living will. You'll hear people say, oh, I have a living will. Um, it's usually an advanced directive. An advanced directive or a living will just tells your physician, your family, and friends what type of extraordinary care you want or you don't want if you're, temp if you're um, terminally ill seriously injured in a coma or you're at, you know, you have to make some end of life decisions. Um, I want to be resuscitated. I don't want to be resuscitated. I want to be an organ donor. I don't want to be an organ donor. I want to donate my body to science. I don't want to donate my body to science. Um, I don't want to be put on life support or I only want to be put on life support, but don't exceed life support beyond a, this particular point. And you can put in what those qualifiers are as you desire. Um, you can say, I don't want to be fed intravenously through a tube. If I have no brain activity, don't keep me alive. If I have the slightest brain activity, you keep me on life support until like there's nothing, there's nothing else. Like all signs of life are actually gone. Um, but those are the decisions you can make now. And that removes the burden and sometimes keeps the conflict down between family members as some of, some of you may have personally gone through experiences like this, and some of you may not have, but from a personal standpoint, I've witnessed and I've been a part of situations where people have had to make some end-of-life decisions or make medical decisions, and everybody just simply doesn't agree. And let's be honest, we live in a day and age where there are a lot more blended families now. And so, you know, um, if you are in a blended family sometimes, the spouse feels like, I know my wife or my husband best, and I know this is what they would want. Sometimes the children come in and say, oh, nope, I know my mom and my dad best, and this is what my dad would want. And those don't necessarily match or meet up. And there's, you know, there's just conflict there. Um, and so with that said, if you can make those decisions now and lessen the burden on your spouse or your children, Now's the time to do it while you have the ability and you have the capability of saying what your desires are. Transferring documents, so like deeds, there are all sorts of different kinds of deeds, and there are deeds you can use in your estate plan to transfer real property that will lower the expense of going through the probate process. Um, and also, if you have a situation where you may want to exclude certain folks or you don't want to have um, everybody goes through the probate process. You don't want everything out there like that. You can take real estate and make it a non-probate asset. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what a probate asset is and what a non-probate asset is in a little bit. Disposition of remains. This is a document that allows you to appoint somebody to be in charge of your remains. This person can, you can, in this document, you can have this person do everything from, I want to be cremated. I don't want to be cremated. Um, donate my body to science. I want to be a part of the body world exhibit that travels the world and be on a museum and, and look like my body is in wax and take my tendons and everything. You can say all of that if you want. You can say, hey, I want to be cremated and I want to be spread across the beach. Um, or I want to I want to make sure I have a burial. I have a burial plot here. I want to be buried here. I want to be buried next to. I want to be buried with. Don't spend more than X amount of dollars on my funeral. Um, I don't want this at my funeral. I do want this at my funeral. You know, the disposition of remains, uh, again, allows you to lessen the burden on those you leave behind, but also make a lot of the decisions for that person that you do appoint. And then, and also communicate to the rest of your family, like, hey, I've already designated a person in charge. Whatever I said, they know what I want. No one needs to interject themselves. No one needs to fight over what has to happen to me. No one has to fight over 
where I'm buried, who I'm buried with, how much, who's going to pay for what, because I would have already made those decisions while I'm alive and while I'm able to make those decisions. So before we go to the next screen, let's talk a little bit about some of the terms that I've used. I use the term probate asset versus non-probate asset. So a probate asset is something that has to actually go through probate. Generally, those are going to be anything that doesn't have a named beneficiary on it, um, that does not have a payable on this or transfer on this. Um, and that's pretty much it for the most part. But so things like your life insurance policies, um, retirement accounts, as long as beneficiaries are listed on those items, they're going to be considered non-probate assets. Bank accounts are going to be considered, um, if it has a payable on death or a transfer on death, a bank account is going to be considered a non-probate asset. If you have a deed upon death or a beneficiary deed, that real estate is going to be considered a non-probate asset. What non-probate assets generally mean, if you take nothing else from what I'm saying, non-probate assets, it, the minute you expire, the minute you take your last breath, you no longer own that asset. It goes to whomever you've named as a beneficiary or a transfer on death or pay on death. Um, that is very important for certain for certain individuals. Now, should you do only um, deeds upon death or beneficiaries deeds or name beneficiaries on all your things? The answer is no. Because generally speaking, there's always something that's left out. So a will is very important to back up that those assets or to be a kind of a catch-all for those assets that you may not have gotten around to or that where you've named the beneficiary, but that beneficiary is no longer alive or that beneficiary isn't valid anymore. Or you may have had some changes that you wanted to make or provide for, um, you know, say you've named the beneficiary when you had only one child, but now you have three. You know, you, by not including those other children, that one child is going to get everything that they're a beneficiary of, and those other two children are going to be left out. And so a will can kind of come in, and you can name um, a trust. If you decide to create, have a trust in your estate plan, you can name a trust as a beneficiary of your IRA, your insurance policies, your retirement accounts, and all of those funds will go into your trust and that trust can be, be there to benefit your descendants, whether that's just a certain group of people, whether that I've had people say, you know what, I don't want to provide for my children. My children are grown. I want to provide for my grandchildren. And so a trust will allow you to provide for the benefit of your grandchildren because your grandchildren won't own it, but they'll get the benefit of, of using some of that, um, those funds or that property or whatever is in your trust. So. Um, Probate assets, like I said, are going to be everything else that doesn't fall within that non-probate asset category. So if you don't have a payable on death on your bank account, your bank account becomes a probate asset. And even if you have a joint account with your spouse, the portion of that account that belongs to the deceased spouse is considered a probate asset. And generally speaking, it must go through the probate process in order for you as the surviving spouse to gain full access to it. Um, and so any heirs could come after you if you spend more than what your co-owner owned at the time of his or her death, then the heirs could come after you for that amount. So when we're setting up these things and we're thinking about our estates and planning for this stuff, it's important for you to know these things, okay? And so we're gonna get into some scenarios and feel free, like I said, to feel free to jump in and ask questions if you guys have it, but I'm gonna do this first scenario and we'll, we'll, we can talk about it a little bit more if you guys have questions. Okay, the first scenario is, so just so you all know, H stands for husband, W stands for wife, C1 and C2 are going to be child one, child two, so you all can follow along with me, okay? So H has a blended family and he dies without a will. So when someone dies without a will, they are considered to die in test state. The law generally dictates how that property passes. So um, typically in a husband and wife situation, there's a resident, 
there may or may not be some investment property, but for the sake of this conversation, we're going to say there's an investment property, um, there's a joint bank account, and there's a car that's in both the husband and wife's name, okay? So husband has a child from a previous relationship, wife has a child from a previous relationship, and then they have two children together. In this type of scenario, 50% of the husband's property, or his primary residence, is going to go to the wife. So the wife will re re maintain her 50%. The husband's 50% will then pass on to his children. So if there's a situation where this blended family, um, let's say husband had taken care of wife's child since that child was very young and husband is the only father that this child knows. And so husband, had he did a will, would, would have wanted to provide for wife's child just like he provided for any of the other children that he had. He claimed this child is his. Um, you would have known no difference between wife's child and his other children because husband treated all of these children as if they were all his biological children. But in this particular instance, that child would be left out. And if that wasn't husband's intended result, that may make that child feel some sort of way, and that family may not be to, may not be able to do much to rectify the situation. Okay, um, fifty percent of the investment property will also go to husband's children. Joint bank account. Now, wife, you know, her paycheck may go into this bank account, but now wife potentially has to share some of this money with husband's child from his first his first relationship. So, you know, we. We need to be thinking about planning when we're doing some of these things. The car that's in both husband and wife's name, if it doesn't have a, a transfer on desk or pay on desk listed on the title, um, these children now own a portion of this vehicle. That may make some people very upset. That may be fine with some individuals, but it's all about our respective situations, um, our family dynamics, our culture, and, and how we want to provide or not provide for certain individuals. So if you don't do something now, the law is going to do it for you, and it may not always be what you intend. And additional, in, in addition to the law doing it for you, it's going to cost you a pretty penny to do it. The average probate does not get out of probate without spending less than $3,500, okay, in attorney's fees, and legal fees and up. That's at a minimum. And it, that varies from state to state and place to place and county to county. And um, size of the state matters as well. Um, so we need to think about these things now. If we can do some planning now, we can lessen that expense for individuals. And we, or we can avoid the expense altogether depending on what's in our state and how we plan. All right. Any questions before I move on to scenario two? Going once, going twice. All right. So in my second scenario, wife becomes incapacitated due to a stroke and does not have a power of attorney in place. How will wife's assets be handled? So if there's a joint bank account, the husband will have access to that. If there's an account solely in wife's name, like let's say, I know some couples have, they have a joint account where they pay all their bills out of, but husband has his own account, wife has her own account, and they, you know, each month or, or on whatever frequency they've agreed upon, they put money into this joint operating account, so to speak. If that is, if that's the case, then any account solely in wife's name, husband will not have access to that account. Retirement account. Husband will not be able to access the retirement account, won't be able to find out information about the retirement account, will not, may ha will not be able to make changes or withdrawals or whatever. You know, let's say they needed to withdraw a little bit of money to provide for wife's long-term care because insurance doesn't take care of it all. Um, well, they wouldn't be able to do that in that retirement account because there's no power of attorney in place. And solely because you're Husband or wife doesn't guarantee, doesn't guarantee you'll be able to jump in there and say, hey, my wife needs or my husband needs. Okay, if there's a home, that other spouse will be unable to sell that house, will be able to, to refinance it, to pull out equity, 
or do anything with that house, okay? Land that's inherited. If wife has some land that she inherited in places where there's separate property and community property, generally speaking, husband will not be able to touch that inherited property, okay? Any questions, comments, or concerns before we move on? All right. So, like we talked about, your estate plan. Once you have your estate plan, you should be reviewing your estate plan at a minimum every year or before. If you're not doing it every year, don't go three years without reviewing your estate plan and or sitting down with someone to evaluate whether you need any changes to your estate plan, okay? If you, if you need to have changes, then you need to sit down with somebody and go ahead and have those changes made immediately because you never know when your estate plan may be necessary. But at a minimum, I'm going to give you a few. Again, this is a few. This is not an all-inclusive list or an exclusive list. But when you experience a life change, you need to review your estate plan. You need to review your estate plan if you are married, if you're divorced, if there's a birth or death of a child and you provided for that child or named that child as a beneficiary on something, um, or you may, or you've appointed them as your power of attorney or your guardian or any other appointments that might be necessary in your estate plan. If you acquire property or sell property or other assets, you should re evaluate your estate plan. If you relocate to another state, you should evaluate your estate plan. Generally speaking, estate planning, the property portion of it is dealt with the local law of whatever state you're in. So if you're in Kansas, Kansas law is gonna dictate how that property is treated within your estate plan. If you're in Missouri, Missouri law, property law is gonna dictate how your property is treated within that estate plan. If you're in Georgia or Texas, so forth and so on. Those laws are going to dictate how your property is handled within that estate plan. Um, one thing I want to point out is in, Can in the state of Kansas, I believe it's Kansas, um, if you are married and you had a plan or a will beforehand, a marriage will void any appointment that you've made um, in, your in your plan. And in some instances, divorce or any sort of dissolution where um, people may not know there are, are suits where you can declare a marriage void if there are certain situations that occur. Um, and in those situations, uh, if you've had an estate plan or you have a will, some portions of your will can be invalidated by just simply getting a divorce. If you have a, have a will and you get married in, in the state of Kansas, your will can be revoked just by getting married. And so while you thought, like, I've done everything, I've checked those boxes, I have my will in place, I have my estate plan in place, some of that stuff may be invalidated solely because there's a marriage or and or a divorce, depending on which side you fall on. Health conditions change. If Once your health conditions change, you really need to sit down and evaluate your estate plan to make sure that decisions you made are still the decisions you want, knowing what you know now about your health conditions. Um, you start or you terminate a business. You need to review your estate plan. If you have any sort of appointees, so any appointments that you made or successors that you've appointed, and when they die or you know or or are incapacitated, you want to review your estate plan to make sure um, your desires and your wishes are still being honored with the estate plan that you have. Uh, generally speaking, when I do estate plans, I usually ask my clients to give me at least three names. I'd like more if possible, but at least three. So we have somebody you're appointing initially, and then we have at least two backups. So if for whatever reason that person is disqualified from being able to act as your appointee, or that person is unable, declined, or doesn't have capacity to do so, then you now have some other appointments without having necessarily to change your estate plan um, if those individuals are also able to um, serve in those different roles. 
And it's very important that you think about that because and we're talking about certain appointments. So powers of attorney, you don't really have to worry about that as much. But when we start talking about guardianships and, and things of that nature, um, those folks have to be able to post bonds. If they're not credit worthy and they're not able to post a bond for the value of your estate, at least they may, even though that's the desire you want, you want them to be able to manage your estate. They may not be able to do so because by law, they don't meet the qualifications to serve in that role. So you want to make sure that you're reviewing your estate plan and you have a discussion with the individuals that you are appointing. And I recommend that everybody have a conversation with your family sit down and we need to get out of the, the habit of not talking about death. Death is, is an inevitable part of life. At some point we will all die. We, know, we don't know the time or the hour, but at some point we will all die. And so it's okay to plan now for that event. At some point we may, we don't know when, what will happen in the future. And it's okay to plan for those what is. You'd rather be prepared than unprepared in those moments, okay? Um, you want to make sure when you have your um, will and all of these documents, your will mainly, you want to make sure that those documents are stored somewhere where people can access them, but also you want to make sure that they're stored somewhere that is very safe so no one will come and steal your will and rewrite it or forge documents. Um, I've had cases where people have taken a will, found it, destroyed it, and created their own will and gave pretty much everything to themselves um, and completely excluded the decedent's only child out of a million dollars or more, a million dollars in cash and about almost two million in property. And we were successful in recovering a portion of it, but most of it had been spent before this child knew what was there. And, and so you want to make sure that the will is put up. If you want to keep a copy out so that in the event of your death, people can access it quickly and be able to go ahead and do take care of your, your affairs, that's fine. But generally speaking, the court must have the original document. And the original document is necessary to proceed. You can proceed on a copy, but there's a lot more hoops you have to jump through to proceed on a copy of a wheel than you do with the original. So any questions before we move on to the next section that we will talk about? I have a question on a uh, yes. power of attorney. Um, if somebody gives you a power of attorney and um, and they're um, not totally incapacitated, but somewhat incapacitated to make decisions, logical decisions. Mm -hmm. What, when does that power of attorney, um, their powers be invoked? And okay. does anybody else have any say over that? or just kind of explain that okay when it comes to powers of attorney you can make a power of attorney effective immediately or springing springing means that some event has to occur before that power of attorney becomes effective generally um, most people may give their spouse an immediate power of attorney and then if they have any subsequent powers of attorney they will make it um, valid upon incapacity or if their spouse isn't able to serve or, or their spouse is incapacitated or whatnot. But you really need to look at the document itself and the document will tell you when this power of attorney becomes valid. If it becomes valid upon incapacity, well then that person has to be, there has to be some level of demonstrable incapacity. Um, you don't necessarily have to always go to court to have somebody declared incapacitated because that would be kind of searching for having a guardian appointed over that person. But, you know, some medical records can say, okay, um, her or his primary care physician may say, 
they're not totally incapacitated, but they're not able to make financial decisions. So your general power of attorney, remember, it's just for your financial, it's just your financial piece of it. It doesn't mean that you can't take care of yourself physically. It just means that when it comes to making financial decisions, I'm not able to fully make, I'm not able to appreciate the risk and the benefits when it comes to making financial decisions. I can't logically think through those things and make reasonable decisions. And so if they're on the verge of, like, let's say they're experiencing early onset of dementia or Alzheimer's or any variation of um, a sort of that brain, more than just a simple brain fogginess, like um, they have sundowners or, or something to that effect, or there's someone coming around that is trying to pump them full of, pump them from, pump money from them frequently, then that may be a situation where you may say, okay, let me get some information from a physician that gives me any indication as to whether or not this person is capable of appreciating the risk involved in making X decision. If, if a physician says, no, I don't think they should be making financial decisions, they're okay to care for themselves. They may be able to live, for them, live by themselves um, because they're, they're, they're able to move around, they're able to cook, you know, those sorts of things, but their mind just may not be there all the way then that may be a situation where you can invoke your power of attorney and say, okay, they've lost capacity. And since they've lost capacity, now my powers are invoked and I'm acting under the authority of that power of attorney. And no one has the ability to come in and convert that. Now, if you get into a situation where people are fighting over something like that, then I would say guardianship would probably be a better option, even if it's a temporary guardianship probably would be a better option. Okay. Did I answer the question? Yes. Any uh, other questions? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm listening very carefully. You're doing a great job, and I thank you. Uh, on this power of attorney, power of attorney over her before she actually got sick. Because she, the complications she went through with her own husband, she did not want anyone to go through that same problem. She did get sick, but the problem she had was that the other family members did not know this when they came to make decisions on certain because they didn't know. That's one problem. They didn't make a problem, but it did become a problem. The second one was after she started doing better, and she seems to be talking reasonable. People thought then there was not really a necessity for her to have a power of attorney to, to make decisions or say things. How do I evaluate or use that? Because you don't go in and out of the power of attorney when just because somebody thinks it isn't viable, do you? Right. So in that particular situation, um, I would probably have a conversation with her and maybe attend the next physician appointment that she has and have somebody evaluate whether or not she's capable of making whatever decisions that she's allowed you to make on her behalf in that power of attorney. Um, if she's not able to make financial decisions on her behalf, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. This is, these are the choices that she made and everybody needs to respect it. Whether she decided to discuss that with them ahead of time or not, these are the choices she made, and they should back off and respect them. But that's one of the reasons I say it's very important for us to have these conversations with our family. Having just general conversations with your family around these issues helps negate some of that conflict when the time comes. I generally, in my estate plans that I do for my clients, I give them a, excuse me, a complete binder. And in and that binder, there's a summary of decisions. There's um, each, uh, an explanation of each document. There's an inventory of all your assets and where they can be found at the time that we, we completed that plan. Um, and there's also um, copies of your documents avoided out 
but there's copies of your document. And then there's an original set that I give you that I put in a folder and I tell you, put this in your safe deposit box or put this in your safe or put this wherever you hold your very documents where people should not be able to access that, that information. But I also provide them the option. They don't have to do it, but I provide them the option to leave a video to their loved ones so that they can explain themselves why they made the decisions they made or communicate whatever it is that they want to communicate to their loved ones. So it's not coming from you. It's coming from that particular individual. And then that way, regardless of what they say in their moments of incapacity, it's it's not like there's conflicting messaging because we all know that there comes a certain time when people get to a point where it's like, I didn't tell that person that, or, or they tell this person one thing because they don't want to hurt their feelings. Um, or they, you know, say something very softly where they were very direct with you when it was communicated to you. And so you kind of go forth with the same fever and, and they are, um, and, and they're kind of like tiptoeing around the issue with the individuals that they feel would be hurt by that person not choosing those individuals to be to act in those roles, especially if those people are children or, or, or whatnot, or spouses in some instances. Um, but it's very important to have those conversations now while we have capacity, because when we don't have capacity, we could say all sorts of things. We could say, I never did that. I never signed a power of attorney. I never did this. I never did in the state plan. You don't know what you may say when your mind is not as sharp or not as with you as it is now. Um, and so that's why you do this type of planning. Okay, thank Any you. Other? I appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to go through. The, I, it's almost seven. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. If we don't finish, it's fine. Um, if you guys would allow, I'll come back and we can talk more about, you know, the second portion of this or redo the whole thing. It's up to you all. Um, but I'm going to go through this next section pretty quickly just so we can be respectful of everybody's time. Um, so in the next section, we're going to discuss Social Security as it re relates to retirement benefits only. Social Security has a lot of different programs. I am not about to get in all the different programs. And we're going to only do a brief overview of that. IRAs and Medicare and Medicaid, and generally with Medicare and Medicaid, we're going to really stick to more so the Medicaid re estate recovery program, um, because that seems to be the issue that I find most clients or most potential clients have questions surrounding. All right, so your Social Security benefits, the benefit you receive depends on several factors, your age at retirement, your earnings during your lifetime, your calendar of retirement, so that actual day that you retire. Um, and then offsets um, from other retirements that you've participated in throughout your lifetime, whether um, that's from a government job like teaching or you work for the federal government. So sometimes your Social Security can be offset or your award of Social Security can be offset by some of those other uh, retirement plans that you participate in. Retirement benefits. The benefit you receive will depend on, I think I did that already. Sorry, guys. Um, so your children, your spouse and your children can receive certain benefits, and those benefits um, generally will depend on your spouse's age at retirement, and they can tap into your particular benefit. These are called auxiliary benefits. Their benefit is usually half of the amount of your own check. So they don't necessarily have to wait until your death but they can receive those benefits if for some reason you become disabled or whatnot, or they become disabled, they can tap into your benefit as well, or your disabled children can tap into that benefit as well. Um, generally, your spouse has to be at least 62 years of age and have been married prior to, or been married to you as the primary earner uh, for a year to claim a spousal benefit. If your spouse claims the benefit prior to age 65, that benefit will be permanently reduced. So it's very important for um, for you all to think about some of these things when you're talking about taking early retirement or pulling out Social Security and those sorts of things. Um, it divorce and Social Security benefits. So if you were previously married, a former spouse to whom you were married to for at least 10 years 
10 consecutive years. And as long as that spouse is still single, at the time they claim um, your benefit, they can receive your spousal benefit. Okay? If you've had one or one more than one 10 year marriage and a single surviving spouse may claim may claim your spousal benefit as well, or they can claim whichever spouse has um, the higher benefit. So you can evaluate that. But it, you, the general rule is you have to be married at least, you have to have been married to that spouse for at least 10 years and you, you have to still be, okay? So if there's multiple marriages, generally you see that if I was married, um, in my first marriage for 10 years, then I got remarried, and then that marriage ended with the death of my spouse rather than a divorce of my spouse. Um, and in that particular instance, you can claim the more recent late spouse um, spouse's benefit, or you can claim your your first spouse, spousal, spousal benefit. Ooh, let's talk about tongue twister. That first spouse's spousal benef benefit. Um, and but you can just evaluate which one is higher and, and claim that particular benefit. All right, Social Security benefits and death. So upon your death or the death of your spouse, um, you may be entitled to the Social Security benefits. You have to be married for at least nine months before the death, uh, before your death or your spouse's death. So if your spouse wants to claim your benefit or you want to claim your spouse's benefit. Regardless, that marriage had to have happened and you guys had to have been married at least nine months before either day, depending on whose who's benefit is being claimed. You have to be at least age 60. If you're disabled, 50 to 59 is sufficient. If you are caring for a disabled um, a child, generally there's, there's no um, age requirement. Minor child, minor child. Um, so if you are a widow or widow or caring for a disabled adult child or minor child, there's no age limit. If you're divorced, again, you have to have that 10-year um, marriage in order to qualify for that spousal benefit. Now, with IRAs, you need to be mindful that with IRAs, there's been some recent law changes under the Trump administration. Now, I don't know if these are going to stay in place or not, given the new administration, but they are the law right now. Um, so there are some mandatory withdrawals with IRAs. You should look at your IRAs if you have them. Um, so your individual retirement plans for those who may not know what an IRA is. But you need to look at those. Make sure there are beneficiaries listed. If you have not listed a beneficiary, generally these individual retirement plans will have or accounts will have some sort of language in um, their contract that says who the beneficiary will be upon no beneficiary being listed. Nine times out of ten, you don't even know who that person is or what order or if that's what your desire is. So you want to make sure you review those and make sure that you do have those um, beneficiaries named on those accounts. As a general rule, when it comes to beneficiaries, you wanna make sure that you're not leaving um, property to minor children. And the reason I say that is because, generally speaking, minor children cannot own property. And so if you leave assets to minor children, it's not gonna go to that child. It's going to go to whoever is appointed guardian over that child. So as a parent, if you have minor children and you are leaving and you have your minor children listed as a beneficiary, whether it's an IRA account, a life insurance plan, or something else, whoever ends up being the person over that child upon your death is going to get that child's benefit. If that's something that's not okay with you or not your desire, then you want to make sure you do proper planning. And some of that planning may include appointing a guardian over your child's um, estate so that, you know, the person who, whether it's the other parent or whatnot, and in some situations, folks may have situations where they may not be with that child's parent. And if they pass away, nine times out of 10, that other parent, it becomes the custodial parent over those, children, over those minor children. 
if that's a situation that you do not want, you want to make sure you plan around something like that. Because while that parent may be, that surviving parent may be the person who has custody of the physical child, you can appoint somebody to be guardian or over that child's estate, meaning the parent who has physical custody won't manage the child's financial affairs. Um, or you can create a trust for that child and put some of these funds in that trust. There are also situations where with IRAs, um, where you can do what's called an, an inherited IRA and you can leave it to grandchildren or children. They need to be at least the age of majority, which is 18 in most states. Um, I think pretty much everywhere is 18. Um, but you can leave them to in, leave them inherited IRAs where they can take your IRA and roll it over into an inherited IRA and kind of avoid some of these mandatory withdrawals that have to happen. So generally, the minimum distribution is generally based upon your life expectancy plus 10 years. And so they have to take out, you know, a certain portion of that IRA once they reach a particular age. And so that may be, you know, maybe better for those who have maybe a younger spouse or not. But if you're, if you have, if you take distributions before you reach about age 59 and a half, there can be penalties for withdrawing. Even if you take that IRA and roll it over into an IRA in your own name after your spouse passes away there could be some penalties that you receive by doing so. And so just taking the time to do some of that research and talk about that with a professional will help in the long run. Medicare and Medicaid deadlines to apply. You have 33, excuse me, three months prior to your 65th birthday and four months after your 65th birthday to apply for Medicare and Medicaid. And that open enrollment period is every January through March. So you're Benefits are generally based upon a means test, meaning they look at the poverty level, they look at the number of people in your household or dependents, and they kind of evaluate where you fall, and then they say, okay, based on your income level or where you are um, and your household size and some other factors that take into account, they look at, you know, property you have and property that might, you know, fall into the exempt category and, and some other things. Um, but they base your qualifications on that, and they say you're you're eligible for a certain benefit. Uh, U.S. citizenship, uh, your residency in your particular state, it will determine um, your qualification. In Missouri, I believe it's HealthNet is the um, the program for uh, the Medicare Medicaid program in that state. So if you're over 65, blind or disabled, that goes into your qualifications and then your medical necessity. If you need long-term care, so like nursing home care, um, for whatever reason, then there are, uh, that goes into your qualifications too. Generally, you can have no more than about $2,300 a month in income for a single individual and about $4,600 a month when we're talking about spouses applying for benefits or, or a couple. Okay, the Medicare or Medicaid estate recovery program. This program allows the state to recover the cost of Medicaid services from an estate for people who receive benefits or apply for benefits after March 1st, 2020, or 20, 2005. Sorry, and you should say in 2021, uh, after March 1st, 2005. What that means is that if you get nursing home care and Medicaid pays for it, then if you own a house or any other major asset in your estate, that program can come after whatever is in your estate to pay any claim that that, that program has. So if they pay $10,000, then they can ask your heirs to pay back $10,000 into this program. They can foreclose your house. So that means if you have a surviving spouse living in a home, then there's the potential that their home could be foreclosed on based on that. Now, there are some exceptions to the general rule. Generally, those exceptions do um, revolve around whether you have a surviving spouse, a disabled child, or you had a child living in the home with you, taking care of you, and they have no other residence to go to. And... Medicare or Medicaid collecting this, um, this claim will provide such a hardship on, on these survivors that you've left behind 
that it doesn't make sense for them to, to go after the claim. But if you don't know that what some of these exceptions are, they can come after and say, hey, we're going to make this claim and you may think you have no right. You may think you don't, you know, you may not know where to turn or what to do. So this is just to let you know there are some exceptions to the general rule. There are ways that you can plan around Medicaid being able to recover, especially your real property under this particular um, program. So we can do things like transfers of deeds upon death or um, beneficiary deeds, because like I talked about before, those documents, the minute you take your last breath, don't belong to you anymore. So the whole point of, you know, having an estate and things of that nature are to set up some of these things and plan for some of these things now while you have the opportunity and you can, you have the capacity to sign, you have the capacity to enter into these things, you have the capacity to make these transactions rather than when you're laying in that hospital bed and now everybody's trying to help you get your, your affairs in order. That's not the time to do your estate plan. The time to do your estate plan is now when you have the ability to do so. Um, I think I talked about that already. So we, this is what I just kind of talked about, about protecting your assets from that. So you want to familiarize yourself with the allowable transfer. So like these upon death or beneficiary, these are some examples. They're not the only ones, but they're just some examples. Uh, so you want to familiarize yourself with look back periods, because if you think that you are going to transfer your property by and say, oh, okay, in order for me to qualify for Medicaid or Medicare, I'm going to sell my house to my children, or I'm going to gift it to my children, or I'm going to gift it to my spouse, or I've heard all sorts of things. I, spouses get divorced um, on paper so that they can qualify or remove income of a, a spouse who's currently working. Spouses, they sell property amongst each other and claim property as separate property in community property states. Um, they sell it to um, children or grandchildren. Um, they do all sorts of things to try to avoid their property being um, recouped in this program or when they're trying to qualify for benefits. And so if you do something and it's a violation, the, these programs have the ability to look back at least five years and determine, have you made any sales for less than fair market value of that particular property? And if you have, you can be penalized. And those penalties generally last about a 12-month period. And they continue for how many ever you how, if, So if you made three transactions, well, now you got three 12-month periods. So you have three years before you will qualify for benefits. You have to wait on benefits. Well, by the time you qualify for, you want to apply for benefits, most people don't have three years to wait to receive these types of benefits. Some do, some don't. So you want to make sure you familiarize yourself with look back periods. You want to understand what you're required to disclose, because if you don't have to disclose it, there's no reason for you to disclose it. And you, un you want to understand when the Medicare uh, or Medicaid, excuse me, a state recovery program applies. And ultimately, the whole purpose for here is you want to plan, 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 plan. That's what we're talking about, planning now while you can. Let's talk a little bit about bank accounts and safe deposit boxes. Now, when it comes to different types of accounts, you need to talk, check with your uh, financial institution. Some of these, you know, some financial institutions will say, oh, no, we don't do accounts like that anymore, so you don't have to worry about it. But that means that if they don't have an account like that and your account isn't set up the way you want it to be set up, then you either need to look at changing financial institutions or you need to make sure that you set up some other things in place so that you can properly plan around what could happen if you have a joint account, okay? So joint accounts without rights of survivorship. For those who don't know what rights of survivorship are, it basically means that upon the death of one of the joint account holders in this particular instance, but rights of survivorship can also apply to property, but uh, um, upon the death of one of the joint account holders that that property either will or will not automatically pass to the surviving account holder, okay? So if it's an account without rights or survivorship, that means that once the, one of the account holders passes away, then now the estate owns a portion of that account and the surviving spouse or the surviving account holder owns the other portion of the account. 
joint accounts with rights of survivorship. Once one of those account holders passes away, the surviving account holder automatically, they don't have to go to probate court. They don't have to ask anybody. They don't have to do anything. They automatically own everything in that account, whether it's a dollar, two dollars, a penny, two pennies, or $10 million or $2,000, they automatically own it, okay? Payable on death or transfers on death. Now, if there's a payable on death, they have no right to make withdrawals. They have no right to um, otherwise use the account as you would. Their rights only kick in in the event of your death. So when you pass away, then that account then becomes ownership of whoever you've named as a payable on death or a transfer on death. There are convenience accounts where you can um, have these accounts set up to where this person can maybe use the account or do some transactions on your behalf, but they don't have general, they can't like change beneficiaries or, you know, close your account. They don't have the same rights as a joint account holder, okay? And then once your once you pass away, they don't automatically get or have access to the funds that are in the account. So those are some things you may want to look at as you age, because there may be somebody who needs to have access to your account. Like let's say you're living with a family member um, for healthcare reasons, and they're the, they're the people that are best able to help you, um, you know get around or care for yourself or whatnot. But once you pass away, you want this account to go to your um, spouse who's in a nursing home, or you want this account to be used for the benefit of your grandchildren or whatever you've planned for this account. That person who was able to kind of help you manage those finances while you were alive won't own that account once you are deceased. Okay, so it's just another way to kind of plan around um, some of those events that could happen in life where we may need to depend on others. Now, with safe deposit boxes, safe deposit boxes, okay, this, when it comes to safe deposit boxes, if you become incapacitated, meaning you do not have the mental capacity to Say I want to go into the bank and open my safe deposit box. I want to take everything out and I want to get rid of my safe deposit box. Or, or you may not even be able to physically walk in a bank anymore. Um, whatever reason you may not be able to get to a bank, who can access that safe deposit box on your behalf? Who can access that safe deposit box upon your death? Now, in the event of incapacity, the only folks who are able to access your safe deposit box is if there's a spouse's name or a joint owner on that safe deposit box in the event of your incapacity, unless you have something like a power of attorney or something of that effect, okay? Upon your death, the only people who can access your safe deposit box are your surviving spouse. Um, if you have no surviving spouse, so a parent of the deceased, um, any adult children or grandchildren, or the executor of your estate, which means somebody has to actually go to court, be appointed to be executor of your estate, whether you've named them or not, they still have to go through the court process and then go in with a court document that says they have the ability to access your safe deposit box. Now, if in the absence of a court order allowing somebody to have access to your estate or start to gather your, your, your personal items, no one will be able to remove anything from that safe deposit box. The only thing they will be able to do, they will only be able to have access to the safe deposit box to go through it to see if there is a will. If there is a will in that safe deposit box, they are not allowed to remove the will. The bank will take immediate possession of the will and send it to the court. And then from there, you, the will will be probated or whatever needs to be done will be done, okay? But the bank will send it automatically. To whatever court or you know if there's if there's a case a court a case filed in court they will automatically send it to um, that particular court if there is they will send it to um, that the clerk whether it's the circuit clerk or um, the district clerk or, or whatever they're called in your particular state or area okay um, and then 
for incapacity reasons, no one, if your spouse isn't on that safe deposit box, they cannot get into that safe deposit box. The only person that will be allowed into a safe deposit box is you will have to go through the full guardianship process to do it, okay? So, any questions about anything we've discussed? It was a lot, and some of it was fast, um, but feel free to jump in, ask questions, give thoughts. Um, Sister Valora, I hope I answered your question regarding uh, making changes or whatnot, but just to clarify a little bit, changes can be done, and, it, and they are easy to make as long as you go back to the attorney who did your estate plan, because They'll already have all the documents drafted. You, will, you all will have already discussed a lot of what your wishes are. So you will just be talking about changes in some of those follow-up sessions. Um, but they're not as simple as saying, oh, I'm going to cross this out on this document and fill in what I really want. Those changes are not going to be valid. Okay? You will have to actually go through the process of making sure those documents are executed properly. So for instance, a will is invalid unless it's signed by the person making the will, what we call the testator or the test, the test strict, um, and then at least two witnesses. And in most instances, you don't have to have your will notarized, but I strongly recommend that your will is notarized because it will help with your will being self-proved. And if they have, if your loved ones have to actually probate your estate, they can go through that probate process a lot faster and not have to jump through as many hoops. And it's generally less expensive of a route to take if your will is what we call self-proof. Now, I don't expect for you all to know how to do your own self-proof will or anything like that, but a lot of the common mistakes people make are that they try to do these things themselves. This is not something I would recommend that you do yourself. Yes, you can go out there on Google or whatever and Google will for your particular state, try to fill in the blanks and do everything where it meets the requirements of the law. But the big question is, is will it honor what you've intended for it to honor? Nine times out of 10, it will not because you will not have the proper tools in place to make sure that your intended results actually occur, or you're going to end up costing your loved ones a lot of money. You will save money on this end, but you will cost your loved ones a lot of money on the back end. Um, and then generally speaking, when we're talking about going through probate, like I said before, the average probate is about $3,500 on the low end. And that's for a pretty reasonable or small size estate. Um, and there are other processes that have to happen when your case goes to probate or your, your estate goes through probate. Uh, many times there has to be something where um, they determine who your heirs are. And so there's an attorney that's appointed in some instances, uh, especially if you die without a will. There is an attorney that is appointed by the court to look for any heirs that you do have. They don't rely solely upon the person saying that, oh, so-and-so passed away and these are the only heirs that they had. They generally will appoint someone to double check that. And if that person, that person is going to bill you to do it or the estate to do it, which means that it lowers the amount of money or assets that um, are there for your loved ones. And so if you aren't going to plan, that is kind of the roadmap that your estate will follow. If you put some proper planning in place, you can avoid sometimes going to probate altogether. Your family never has to go to probate. If you have an estate where you just don't want all of your stuff being public record, we can plan around that and have everything done in a lawyer's office or have your estate distributed privately where you don't have to go through the probate process. But if those are your desires, you have to make those arrangements now. You can't wait until you're gone or you can't wait until you don't have capacity to make decisions or you're laying on your deathbed and somebody's going to question whether or not you, they should have been included in your will or they know you would have included them had you not been, um, you know, hooked up to machines or 
or experiencing this traumatic life event or whatever the case may have been, um, you want to make sure you can make those decisions now is the bottom line. Questions, comments, concerns?